Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Dee, I'm with Anoma, um, and we're building this protocol. So basically, what is Anoma? Anoma is a distributed operating system for intense centric counterparty discovery and privacy preserving scale invariant computation under heterogeneous trust assumptions. Most people probably want to hear about intents, but I'm not going to talk about this. I'll talk about scale invariance and heterogeneous trust because this is a, a precondition for like getting intents the way we want them to be. So what is scale invariance? Uh, scale invariance means that the protocol is the same for agents across all scales. And for example, in a scale invariant system, a user account that you know from Ethereum, for example, and a validator set would be treated the same at the protocol level. But it doesn't mean that like, the behavior of all agents to all agents needs to be the same because they can have extra knowledge. This extra knowledge we call side information, and we call it side information because it's out of band of the protocol. Uh, agents can use this in any decisions they make for interactions and changes to site information or information derived from site information or mechanisms on site information don't require any changes to the base protocol. If you want to read more about this, Barnaby wrote a great article. Uh, I will also upload the slides if you want to click on any links later. Um, okay, now we know what scale invariance is. N now we want to know why do we want this. Uh, basically, if we have a scale invariant system, it makes us, uh, we, we, we would like to choose guarantees for every application, for example, if I want to buy a sandwich, I don't need expensive global consensus. Um, we would like also to be able to scale horizontally. For example, if I have independent interactions in a network, I would like to be able to have more of them if I add more resources. But if I have a non-scaling system, then it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Our conjecture is that this behavior, uh, this is easier to achieve if we have a scale invariant system. So now what is heterogeneous trust? So basically, uh, we have different trust assumptions for different agents, institutions, uh, communities, whatever. For example, a single validator set will probably never be one that everybody can trust that ever wants to act, uh, interact on some protocol. So for finite size communities, though, we have seen that they have built institutions, for example, consensus providers or chains that they can trust. For example, the Ethereum community trust the Ethereum validator set, but probably other people will not trust the Ethereum validator set for like a wide range of reasons. Um, we conjecture also that agreement of uh, institutions across different communities of trust is easier to achieve if it's per interaction and not for like the whole use its duration of a protocol which might be like infinite if it's a really good protocol or it will turn into legacy software at some point. But yeah, so only assume that there is agreement on trusted intermediaries or consensus providers for certain interactions. Um, we want to enable this agreement for inter-community interactions, but we want to be able to make this, inter uh, this, this um, agreement as finely grained as possible. So basically maximize locality of the agreement if I have one community and I want to interact with some person from another community, either composing the trust that is between these two communities or picking a third, then, a third one that we both trust if the other party doesn't trust us or something like this. So basically give us the small increments, the smallest possible increments. Yeah, and since we can't predict all the trust needs of future developments for applications and uh, communities or whatever, we want to keep all of that out of band because we want to build a protocol that we would like to use for a while. And the more we put into the protocol, the less generally useful it will be. So we put all the trust information into site information, including if consensus is provided at all or if it's just one person signing over some state. So what do we need to do that? Um, for scale invariance, for example, all of this is conjecture. We might turn out to be wrong, but like this is our best uh, state of knowledge so far. We want a global identity space. We want a global state space. We want to only assume local views of the state space um, and the identity space, as in if you know some identity or if you know some blob of state, you know that one. But there is no all-knowing observer who can see everything because we're like in a distributed system and everything is hard. And we want to have composition of views to achieve these things like composing trust zones or communities. 
And to support heterogeneous trust, we need separation of protocol syntax and trust semantics. And how do we get there? So, um, how do we get a global identity space? We take generalized cryptographic identity, basically public, private key scares, uh, generalized, we'll talk about this soon. A global state space, we can take content address state atoms, like a UTXO that has like a unique hash, or like a generalized UTXO that has a unique hash that is dependent on what the UTXO is and not something external. Um, how do we assume local views? We don't assume global views. Easy. Um, composition of views, though, is a bit harder. The, for this, we need composition of identities, so the generalized notion of identity we are building needs to be composable in some sense. And we need consensus that is ideally also composable. So how do we generalize identity? Um, we want to implement a general abstract interface because if we now take, I don't know, RSA or ECDSA or ED255, whatever, then um, we fix that at the protocol level and upgrading once we figure out, okay, this cipher is actually broken now, it's getting harder, so we only try to agree on the um, interface and then we can pick canonical schemes later, but we can pick the schemes, like then it's just a lot of out-of-band decision that people need to agree on that, okay, now we're using RSA instead of this, or we're using uh, ED2559 instead of RSA, but we don't need to change the protocol, we need only change local implementation so everyone who's using a certain cipher can communicate with everyone else who's using that on the protocol. Um, we also want to composition uh, to enable constant behavior at different scales. So basically, if I have one identity, I want to have another identity, and I want this identity to be able to smoosh together, so I get one identity that contains them both with some logic that is well-defined. So how do we generalize public and private keys? We say, okay, we have an external identity, and that has a key for verifying messages that are sent to it, and a key uh, for verifying messages that come from it and a key to encrypt messages that we want to send to it. And we have the message ver methods verify and encrypt that apply these two keys. We assume that these keys are public information. For the generalized private key, we build an internal identity where we do the same with a signing key and a decryption key. And we assume that anyone who has access to these keys can send messages that are signed as this identity or decrypt messages that, that were sent to this identity. These two keys can be the same, these two keys can point to like one byte string, these two keys can be totally different, but basically here we only assume that the keys are some bytes that some cipher takes that fulfills the interfaces we defined. So now to compose that entity, we define, for example, an AND, where we say, okay, if you want to verify that a message was sent by an AND composed identity, you need valid signatures of both. If, you, if we have two identities, we compose of both identities that compose this identity. And if we want to encrypt something for them, we encrypt it with both the keys of the identity. So everyone in this identity needs to collaborate to decrypt uh, the message. We can also define an OR where we say, okay, any signature of the set would be sufficient to tell us, okay, this is a valid message from this or composed identity, and if we encrypt for them, we encrypt it with either key. We encrypt it with either key, um, so that uh, we, we encrypt it with both keys in parallel, so either party can decrypt it. Um, the analogous construction goes for sign and decrypt uh, operations. And here we have an example, for example, if we want to have an any two out of three threshold identity that we built from A, B, and C, we give, uh, we get like a couple of connectors and then the interface is defined. And this generalizes to, for example, staking problems or other threshold schemes. Okay, now we want to have a state model that fulfills the properties that we like. And here we say state resources are the atomic units of state in our system and we want them to generalize UTXOs in a well-defined sense. Um, every agent of the system has a local view of the state space, like a subset of the state resources in it, and agents also have identities to sign observations of the state space that they personally do in their local view. So now, what is a resource? Every resource is unique, content addressed and immutable. Immutability, we probably know. This is like, you make the resource and it's, if it's validated enough at some point, like this is going to stay forever. Content addressing means uh, we just hash the whole thing and that's the address of the thing in the system. 
So if the content changes, the address changes, and it's unique, we put a nonce in there to make it unique. Wait, more later on that. We also have a predicate, which basically gives us uh, more generalizability of that. For example, we can say, OK, um, this resource is fungible with these types of resources, or you can actually double spend this resource exactly once, or you can never double spend it. Basically, this is just a function that takes like some input transition and says if it's a valid transition for this resource. So we constrain which transitions you can do for each resource. We also put a label, which would be equivalent to the denominations you already know. So in our sense, that basically defines a subspace in the namespace. That could be, for example, also your identity. It could be a resource that says the holder of this identity may mint um, quantities of this resource in this subspace. Um, yeah, and we call the predicate and label together the resource type because that makes them fungible at the base level of the protocol. You can also um, define like more fungibility in the predicate, but like the if the predicate and the hash are the same, they will always be fungible for the protocol. Um, yeah. Then we have the value, which is the thing that actually contains the stuff that is in this state blob. Um, like you can think of a resource as a cell that has some contents that represent a thing you want to represent. And then we have the nonce to make things unique, so we can track distinct things if they're even this, if they're the same type and the same value and the same quantity, and everything is the same, but we want them to be unique to track history. So we put a nonce, which is basically just a hash that we generate every time, a UUID, if you will. And then we have a controller, which is like an identity that defines the authoritative history of these resources and transactions on them. Uh, you can imagine, for example, the Ethereum validator set as a controller for ETH tokens. Um, if you have your personal token as defined in like, this is my token predicate, then the controller, the, the first controller would probably be the issuer, which is you, or you can transfer controllership to a consensus provider that you trust to give liveness guarantees that are better, or if people don't trust you because your machines are like uh, broken or like easily compromised, then you just need to make sure that you generate the keys on a correct thing and like transfer controllership. Ownership is a different thing. Ownership is the person that, or like the entity that is holding the token at the moment. Yeah. So now from resources, we can go to local state views. Here we have agent one, um, which is the controller for resources of type A. Um, the resource A exists in a global namespace, but agent one only sees a tiny part of this. We can track transactions, and for example here, transactions consume something of type A and create something of type A. Let's say this is just like some cell that is a counter, um, but it's a no, no double spend counter, so you can only count up once, so resource A would be one and resource A prime would be two, or like some something else. Um, sequences of these transactions we just call histories, as everyone else usually does. Um, the controller of the resource is the authoritative source of the history as well, unless the controller changes, like the controller can sign off on handing off controllership to someone else, for example. Um, we can have many of these histories in parallel, uh, curated by different controllers. Um, but as we've learned before, we have postulated that agents can compose their identities. So let's see what happens if we compose identities. We get like this new agent one plus two identity. Um, and if they now run consensus, which can either be H Paxos or just like saying, okay, a, either one of these people can sign this and they trust each other. The consensus algorithms will also be side information. It's just if the identity says, this is our history, this is our history for this identity. Um, and we don't need to care at the protocol level at how they agree on that. Um, now, what happens if there's a conflict in the histories we want to compose? Uh, we need to resolve the conflict. If we have resources that A and B, for example, are fungible in our setting, and we say no double spending, now uh, someone in the view of agent two wants to double spend. Um, if we merge them, or like in the view of agent two, this would not be double spend yet because they don't know about what's happening under agent one's purview. But on merging histories, a, a prime prime would be double spend, or like a, a, a prime would be double spend too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So now we need to resolve the conflict, and that usually is the controller's responsibility. Um, so here we just say, okay, we slash it, we're good. And then we have conflict-free histories, and we can compose the identities, run consensus, and compose our views going forward. There's one view that both of these trust. So what do we achieve with all of these gymnastics? We get a canonical syntax for an identity model and a canonical syntax for a resource model. Everything else is side information, for example, trust assumptions and uh, the assumptions about what consensus nodes do, how trustworthy they are, which algorithms are used, and everything else, like economic histories. Uh, we can define trust metrics, uh, network transports, you call it. The only things we agree on is the, the syntax on top. So basically, you can bring your own semantics for everything that is outside of the resource and identity model. Um, and with the globally canonical protocol, we, have, we can enable global interaction. Um, and because we get scale freeness from the composability, as we've seen before via consensus and uh, identity composition, we can enable interaction between entities of different sizes to just have the same mechanisms on the protocol level. So if there's just like some user, um, the interaction with this user would look the same as the interaction with a chain, or the interaction of a huge chain would be the same as an interaction with a small, ch uh, with a small chain. So basically like IBC, uh, but like faster and better. Um, yeah, if we, have local, if we keep the semantics local, that enables flexible and local decision-making about everything that is not uh, verification of histories or compiled views. For example, we can decide about network routing, um, we can make decisions about economic exchanges because we have uh, records of like how trustworthy you were, did you defect, did you not defect, um, but all of this is not encoded in the protocol, this is information we derive from things that happen on the protocol. And also cooperation and infrastructure maintenance like valid data sets or network infrastructure for transport uh, can be shared in that way without having any influence on the protocols. So basically, oops, yeah, basically we, um, we, figured out, we, we try to figure out the minimal syntax that we can have to support the maximum amount of semantics that people can freely work with, with so that we don't need to upgrade the protocol if new use cases need new semantics. And we hope that we have covered most of the useful syntax for like a lot of use cases. Yeah, that's it. If you want to track our progress, uh, research at anoma uh, research .anoma .net is our research forum. We will paste regular updates in threads. Um, you can find me on GitHub. Um, that usually has other contacts. Uh, we welcome feedback questions, ask critical questions, break stuff. Um, we have Little ego in that, we would like to get a good solution out for the community. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions? I'm just gonna be a really basic question, just curious to understand who um, actually runs the protocol, like it's, it, there's, you know, this local views and people caring about different things, but is there, I guess, what is global about the protocol ultimately? Uh, so basically, because we use content addressing, the global thing is just the space of possible hashes of things, and everyone can run their own infrastructure. You can just run an Anoma node on your smartphone, and it will look the same to me like a big validator set. It will probably have less bandwidth, and it will have less liveness, and I will, you will probably tell me, hey, I'm just one guy, or the validator sets will have like some social proof or outside pr out of band proof that they're an actual trustworthy validator set. So my decisions, how I behave towards you or the validator set will be different, but um, ideally it would be runnable on like different kinds of infrastructure, only constrained by how much throughput you want to have. Like if you want to have, I don't know, Kreuzberg consensus to buy coffee and bread, then you would probably get away with just having a couple of Raspberry Pis if you want to run consensus for like Europe or the Ethereum community or whatever. You will need bigger machines if you just want to run consensus for you, your five friends. You can probably do it on your smartphone. 
Yeah, but the idea is to make it as easy as possible for communities to run their own institutions, to not depend on outside uh, infrastructure maintenance from other people. So they can implement the trust assumptions they have. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Um, since you're abstracting over uh, different mm -hmm. signature schemes, um, there are a number of signature schemes that could have collisions, and that kind of breaks one of the core assumptions. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, how, how you're thinking about that. Um, that kind of allows for a double spend locally, but it seems like that that could be kind of exploited for like a. Uh, it, a kind of global compromise, if you know, depending on the the kind of interaction that that your protocol has with some form of global state. Yeah, um, for these schemes, for example, you will need somewhat canonical decisions. Everyone you want to interact with should use the same scheme, so the community should have a debate about which scheme is the best and which scheme has the fewest collision. And like, if you use a good scheme collisions will probably not happen in practice, and there can also be ways to do conflict resolution once, once the histories get merged where these um, collision-based double spends happen. If you use uh, bad signature schemes, then you have a problem, yes, you should not do that. We just want to give you the possibility to have the debate with your community which signature schemes to use, because probably Different communities have different trust assumptions and different cryptographic primitives or different threat models or different resource constraints. So if you're extremely resource constrained, then it might be a good choice to accept more collisions, um, but still be able to do the computation you want to do, for example. We don't want to be dictating you what, you, what your choices should be. Okay, thank you.